Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fresh, Natural, and Live. I hope you had a great weekend, and uh, we look forward to a wonderful show tonight. Uh, for those of you who are online who uh, get our uh, broadcast, sorry, I did not broadcast this show in advance. We were dealing with weather issues last week and catching up from that. But uh, we have an exciting show tonight, especially as a cardiologist. Uh, patients often come to my office, and, and uh, they're often concerned about the heart, and then frequently they say, hey, doctor, uh, do I have uh, heart disease? And there's many ways that te that uh, question can be answered because we look at heart disease in a variety of ways. So we look at heart disease from the standpoint, uh, the chronic condition of the heart. Is the heart weak? Is it strong? Uh, do you have plaque buildup in the arteries? Uh, do you have uh, effects uh, uh, of the heart muscle secondary to hypertension? There's certain tests that we can do that gives us some insight as to whether there's some looming risk of some event. You know, do you have inflammation in the heart blood vessels? Do you have uh, uh, inflammatory process going on in the heart that could weaken the heart? Something that's putting you at risk of some cardiac event in the future. So tonight I'm excited about our guests. We have uh, an excellent guest, an expert in uh, biomarkers of cardiovascular disease, uh, as well as many other things. Uh, but we'll be talking about what shape is your heart in and what tests we can do to determine if you are at risk for some cardiac event. This is very important uh, information, piece of information, because heart disease is the number one killer in the United States of men and women. In fact, more women die from heart disease than men. And so the more we can do to detect things or problems with the heart early on, the better off we can be. So I think you're going to find this show uh, very informative and enlightening. So without further ado, I'm going to bring our panel on. Um, welcome to the show, Isosa. Hello, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much. And I hope you had a great weekend and I hope your Monday's been good. You're always busy, so I'm, you're excited about your work. So I'm sure you're, you had a great Monday. But anyway, welcome to the show. Thank and you. we have our resident pediatrician. Hello. 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 How are you doing? And uh, Celeste is on. Just, I'm sure she had a busy day saving lives in the pediatric uh, world. <laughs> and um, so she'll be here. So uh, I want to bring on our guest, uh, Dr. Douglas Harrington. Uh, Dr. Harrington has over 30 years of experience in research, development, commercialization, and expansion, expansion of innovative healthcare technology and services. Uh, he holds a number of patents, including automated image analysis and residual cancer protein, catalytic heavy metal extraction, and biomarker assays for diagnosis and classification of cardiac disease. In addition to being CEO and lab director of Global Discoveries Biosciences, Dr. Harrington is clinical professor of pathology at the USC Keck School of Medicine, a published author of numerous peer-reviewed uh, papers, and a sought-after speaker worldwide in the area of preventive medicine. We are excited tonight to bring to you Dr. Harrington. Hello, Doug. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Great to be here, as usual. Well, so, thanks for coming and joining us again. This is your second time uh, coming to uh, our show on our platform, and, and we're always excited to, to uh, have you on. And um, we, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the uh, uh, onset of the show, uh, you know, heart disease is the number one killer. And you know, many people, sudden death, in fact, is the number one cause of death. And many people don't know that. Uh, we talk a lot about many uh, illnesses, whether it's diabetes and and, and, and um, coronavirus yeah. <laughs> and illnesses. But the number one cause of death is dying suddenly. And um, in fact, um, the data, when I last looked at it, roughly about 40% of the people, their first sign of heart disease is sudden cardiac arrest. And so it can be very dramatic. It affects all of us, men and women of, of uh, you know, almost all ages. I mean, we've seen individuals in their 30s and 40s have heart attacks and cardiac arrests and the likes. And so these acute cardiac events are things that, you know, we have a problem with and we try to learn how to address, but uh, what it, you're gonna help us with tonight is some things that we can look at, tests we can do in uh, our offices, uh, doctor's offices to uh, pick up the risk of some acute event like this. And so I look forward to your presentation and, and forward to your comments, so. Cool. 
Well, it's, it's a great to be here. I'm still with my COVID beard, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. You, you guys still in lockdown. You're in California, right? You're in Southern yeah. California. Yeah, you know? yeah, but but Orange County doesn't behave like it's in lockdown. But they do. They are very careful. You know, they wear masks and they and they uh, social distance. But it's pretty much business as usual down here right now. And our infection rate's relatively low, so it's good. Wow. So you're ignoring the governor, in other words, right? Oh, you know, a lot of people are ignoring the governor here. They're trying to recall him. I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of politicians from any persuasion. So <laughs> I'm the person to ask. I, I don't like, uh, no offense, but I don't like Republican Party or Democratic Party. I'm, I, I consider myself an independent, but they made it impossible to vote here if you're an independent. So, oh, really? Wow. Yeah, you, you, you're you restricted in the primaries, and I, I don't know, it's kind of crazy. But we have really good people here, and that's what's important. That's so. good. Yeah, all, all politics are local. Well, I'm going to bring up your slides here, and I uh, understand you have some great case presentations, and, and you're just going to give us some overview of uh, what is cardiac testing and, and biomarkers. Can, can I give a start from how you got to where you are? I mean, you, you have a background in, in pathology, but... How does one get to uh, you know, there? Well, I actually have three boards, and, and I'm a fellow of the American Society of Preventive Cardiology, so I'm also a hematologist. But uh, I was originally trained in cardiothoracic surgery, maybe oh, before wow. some of our colleagues here were born. But And, you know, as a member of the first heart transplant team that came out of Stanford, um, and, you know, when you're a resident in cardiothoracic surgery, you graduate from being the retractor during surgery to actually doing something. And, <laughs> and it was kind of exciting. But after about 30 of these, I realized that most of these patients were suffering from self-induced disease. Mm -hmm. And I just I, I sat there, I looked in the mirror and I said, you know, I'm not sure this is the way I want to spend my career. I think I'd rather try and figure out ways to prevent this because... You know, if you look at all the data, 90% of heart disease is due to lifestyle, not genetics. I mean, clearly there are some genetic conditions like Brugada syndrome and long QT, but the polygenic risk scores for predicting what's going to happen to you with sudden death and that sort of thing really have, they've failed and uh, not done well. So, so I decided to make a career switch and figure out how to detect these people before they came in. Because you know, our whole our whole system is designed around disease. We yeah. we won't see you until you're sick. Now what's what, what's screwed up about that? I mean, I, I wonder what the other panelists think about that. You know, it's just not right, I don't think. I agree with that. I'm really big on how do we prevent things with lifestyle and behavior? How do we look at someone's family history of disease and help them now so that they're not going to like fall into the same behaviors that their ancestors did. Yeah. And, you know, you have um, Baxter beside you, you have two extremely important people on the panel because if we could start teaching kids at the level of the pediatrician to do things correctly, we would greatly impact what happens later on. I mean, we really got to get to the kids and, um, and I, and I, and then what Isosa does, you know, you really are what you eat because most of our people are killing themselves with really bad food choices and, uh, and not exercising appropriately. So we, we, you know, we really devoted ourselves to that and that's really how I got there, but I've done a lot of crazy things. I've been involved in startups and entrepreneurial things and still, still am in academics. So I'm, and I have six kids, so I'm very familiar with Celeste's practice. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, uh, I think all of your patients are eating perfectly well. Is that correct? Uh, I wish, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> McDonald's it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, kids, my kids had a thing for Chick-fil-A. I couldn't, I couldn't talk them out of it, but we, we don't go there anymore. We don't go to any fast foods, thank yeah. God. You know, but anyway, I, I, you know, would you like me to go ahead and go into a little of this? Or? Sure, let me get your slides out. Okay. Slides up. Uh, I'm... 
Wow, that looks good. Let me uh, let me make them big. Is that better? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Well, um, I, I'm going to talk over some of this, and you guys just interrupt me. But most doctors are familiar with things like CRP, blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, and uh, and those are all important. But there's one thing missing from them, and that is that 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 with the exception of CRP, they don't necessarily come from the organ that's really damaged, that's responsible for heart disease. Now, CRP, when you, CRP is the most commonly used biomarker for cardiac disease, surprisingly. And the limitation of CRP is that it predominantly comes from the liver, not the, uh, not the heart. Oh, and, wow. and the reason that's important is because it, and it, and it's a very important acute phase reactant. And, um, and, and there are some other biomarkers like uh, myeloperoxidase and um, LPPLA2, which used to be called the plaque test. And if you read those papers, they're really designed for people with chest pain. Now, I, I don't know about you, Baxter, but if I have a patient with chest pain, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to wait three or four days for a lab test to come back. I'm going <laughs> to go into the emergency room and say, let's do a troponin and an electrocardiogram, and we'll get an answer right away. And, uh, you know, troponin is one of the most important uh, biomarkers for use in the emergency room for people with chest pain. Because um, if it starts increasing here, it's above the 99th percentile. It's, it's virtually diagnostic of uh, myocardial damage. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with all of those. And, and the other distinction is they correlate with disease, but they don't actually um, predict disease um, with the exception of troponin. Um, so what, I'm what I'd like to talk to you about briefly is a different way to look at heart disease, which is looking at the organ that's really damaged, which is the lining of your arteries, the endothelium. So, um, and, and we developed a test, it's a blood test it's called the pulse cardiac test. Pulse stands for protein unstable lesion signature because it's not measuring lipids. And what it does is, you know, it allows us to identify damage to the lining of arteries. It's called endothelial damage. We can quantify that. And then we use that to identify your residual risk. And then we can predict your risk of having a heart attack in the next five years. And the reason that's important is because we're actually detecting the disease from the organ that's damaged, and it gives you plenty of time to do something about it. So, and it's optimized for um, patients 40 years and older, but if you're Native American, South Asian, Middle Eastern, or have a history of familial hypercholesterolemia, or have risk factors, you can do it in patients down to the 20s. Um, and, it, and the reason it works is because the most common cause of damage to your endothelium, there are two of them. One is free radicals, and the other is infectious agents like COVID or influenza. And what happens is that the endothelium sends signals out to your immune system saying, fix me. And it was developed in five cohorts representing about 41,000 patients and I, I don't want to I don't want to belabor the point. I just want you to get an idea that that it it does some pretty interesting things. And this slide is from MESA, which is the multi ethnic study of atherosclerosis. And uh, this was done independent of our group uh, by the uh, NIH National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And when you're entered into that cohort, what happens is you get a gold standard workup to make sure that you don't have heart disease. And then they follow that cohort for a minimum of five years, but it's usually around eight to 10 years until they have enough people who have actually had events. And then they compare those to people who did not have events. And what they did at the beginning of every entry for a patient is they take DNA, RNA, serum, and plasma, and they archive it at minus 80 degrees. And what they did with the pulse test is they took that blood from back in, in the entry point of those patients, and they asked two questions. Of all the people that went on to have an acute coronary syndrome in the next five years, how many, and they were missed, they were missed by the gold standard workup. 
the pulse test identified 61% of those patients. And then they said, okay, if you had a normal pulse test back then, what does that mean to a patient over the next five years? And it has a 97% negative predictive value. So you can see this test was really designed for prevention and to identify a disease process very early on. And the reason it can do that is because that endothelium gets that damage. It, it Normally you can repair that, but if you have like where arteries bend or where they bifurcate, you get strange currents and the injury gets ahead of the body's ability to repair it. And you get these walled off lesions that are like pimples or blisters on the side of the artery and they become inflamed and then they go boom. And that's, there are 10 pathways, 250 proteins that we identified in these lesions. And that's why no single biomarker is really sufficient to it. So, so, so Doug, real quick, I know you're gonna go into some of the details, but I just wanna clarify something you just said. So when they looked at it, uh, there was a 97% negative predictive value. So if, after five years of people who had a low pulse score, 97% of those, it predicted 97% of those people would not have an event. Is that correct? That is correct. And then uh, an abnormal pulse score five years out, 61% of those people had an event. Yes. Okay, so for an abnormal pulse score, there's a six in 10 chance of having an event five years out. So, but the real power is that if you have a low pulse score within, and that's that less than 3.5, and I know you're gonna go over the scoring system, I just wanna make sure my notes are correct. Yeah, can I correct one thing? Sure. So the 61% was identifying all the people that were missed by the gold standard workup. Ah. But the actual pulse score gives you an absolute risk score that's personalized for you. So in other words, it's like a fingerprint for you personally. So we give you, it. We'll, we'll, let's just use a 10% score as an example. That means patients of your age and sex with your score, about 10% had a heart attack in the next five years, but 90% gotcha. did not, okay? Gotcha. So, gotcha. But I'll, I'll explain how to put that in context in a minute. Okay. Perfect. okay. Sounds like a winner. Okay. So um, there are nine biomarkers in the algorithm and four clinical factors. And I just want to go over those briefly because we don't have time to go into detail. But IL-16 is actually the first signaling molecule that comes out of your endothelium. And what it does is it tells injured endothelial cells to secrete CTAC, which calls in T cells, and they regulate the local inflammatory response. MCT3, which recruits monocytes, and they become macrophages and eat damaged cell and tissue and eotaxin, which recruits eosinophils that are more normally associated with uh, allergies. And um, the reason they're important is because when the endothelium is injured, fibrin sticks to it and fibrin interferes with the healing. And uh, so it, the eotaxin uh, really protects the endothelium and allows the repair process. These are formation molecules. The progression ones are useful for determining where a patient is and there are three of them. And fast and fast ligand are like an endocrine feedback loop. <clears throat> if the cells that are injured can repair themselves, you'll see fast predominate. But if there's a lot of injury or if it's recent, you'll see fast ligand predominate. So where they are on the bar graph in the report's very important. But the most important molecule here is hepatocyte growth factor. And the reason it's so important is because it is responsible for thickening the cap over these lesions that are like pimples and it stimulates collagen formation smooth muscle hypertrophy and uh, decreases inflammation and then we have two that you'd be familiar with hdl which in this setting is protecting the site of injury it's a it's a potent antioxidant by the way and it's protecting the site of injury from further free radicals and hemoglobin a1c is a marker of endothelial cell insulin sensitivity. So how healthy are your endothelial cells? And that along with age, sex, diabetic status, and family history make up the pulse test. Now- No, um, I'm sorry. What, can I put another slide real quick? Sure. You said something about the, um, the HGF uh, hematocyte growth factor. 
So it forms collagen, and you, you mentioned that this helps form the thickening of the coat around the lesion that looks like a pimple. And, 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 and I want to kind of emphasize that to our audience, because oftentimes when I talk, when I describe the mechanism of a heart attack to our patients, it's like these plaque in your arteries yeah. is like pimples. And some pimples are have a hard core, and some pimples are fragile where you can pop very easily. And so this HGF molecule uh, actually helps stabilize that pimple to keep it from popping. And if you keep that pimple from popping, you, you decrease the heart attack or you decrease the risk of heart attack. Is that a reasonable explanation from your perspective? Absolutely. That was smart. Okay. And, and I want to have, I want our audience to, to be on top of that because, I mean, you're giving some very good technical information. It's hard to vo avoid it. Uh, because I think the detail is important, but I want to uh, pick out these little nuggets because that, that's an important aspect of heart attack mechanism. I'm sorry, go ahead. Can you, can you also yeah. just uh, say again what you were saying about hemoglobin A1C? I'm, I'm, I feel like that's something that I, it's just so common to see someone with a high hemoglobin A1C and then their, their cholesterol numbers are off. Can you go into that connection again? Yeah. So um, what happens is in order for the endothelial cells to function, mm -hmm. appropriately, and by the way, endothelial cells are extremely complex cells. They were, they used to be kind of glossed over, but they are very potent. They have a lot of activities, uh, nitric oxide production, et cetera, et cetera. And when they don't have, uh, when you age, you lose some insulin sensitivity. And if your endothelial cells are not doing well, uh, in other words, they're not very sensitive to insulin. They don't function well. They're more easily damaged. And we know that for each percent increase in hemoglobin A1C, the cardiac risk goes up maybe three to five percent. It's pretty potent. So, so it makes sense that it's here, but it is a marker of endothelial cell health in this setting. Okay. 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 That was a good question because that's I, I didn't really. Uh, now, um, this this gets into the heart of why we are interested in the pulse cardiac test. Um, and these numbers may be familiar to some of you, but um, I, I my uh, focus is on lifestyle and prevention. And because of that, I'm, I'm not always going to be looking at the things that seem to be more popular. One of them is LDL cholesterol. The, uh, there's nothing wrong with looking at it because it is a modifiable risk factor. But in 138,000 first admissions for acute coronary syndromes, and this is the Get With The Guidelines study from the American Heart Association, 83% of them were at target. So if all you're looking at is that, you're going to miss a lot of these people. And the other thing that's really disturbing, and this study came out of Houston, is that nearly half of all heart attacks are silent. And the reason that's important is because if you've had a symptomatic heart attack in the next 12 to 18 months, you're very likely to die of another one. And it turns out these silent heart attacks have the same uh, risk. And then this one, go ahead and interrupt if you need to. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the, I want to comment on that LDL cholesterol goal less than 130. You know, that was a previous goal. And, uh, you know, I trained under Lance Gould uh, at UT here in Houston and, and for a long time, and I was I was a uh, cardiology EP fellow back in the uh, 90s. And at that time, he was saying that our LDL goal should be 70, uh, around 70 or less. And he was laughed at initially. Uh, and as it turned out, when we started looking at it, LDLs, I mean, it actually has to be less than 100 and down to 70 because they found, uh, as you're showing here, uh, this data increased risk at LDLs, you know, above 70 or 80. Yeah, uh, and no so, question. Yeah. Now, now there is a. We'll come back to that in a in, in a later slide because there are two things going on with LDL, um, and and what's interesting is that LDL, if your endothelium is damaged, mm -hmm. uh, the LDL is is very prone to slip into that damaged area and build up underneath the endothelium. Right, it gets yeah. in there, and it it, get, it can get oxidized. But, and this is not in a slide here, but I, I think um, 
He's supposed to might get a kick out of this. It turns out that most people think that it's LDL that's the source of most of these free radicals. It turns out that every day in your body, you're breaking down red blood cells and your body does not want to have free iron in it. And it turns out that that iron from the red cell breakdown stimulates the production of hydroxyl ions, which are the most potent uh, oxidated, uh, you know, free radicals in your body. And that may be responsible for a lot of the endothelial injury that occurs. Wow. So, and, and we know that people with hemochromatosis who have excess iron are very prone to ischemic damage. And if you reperfuse them, they're much more liable to have reperfusion injury than people who don't have hemochromatosis. So iron is something that's really important to all of this, okay? And the iron is causing the endothelial damage, is that correct? Yes, it, it, it facilitates it by creating hydroxyl free radicals uh, from the breakdown of red cells. Mm -hmm. And um, what's interesting is that glutathione will counteract that dramatically. Yeah. So, so you can get, you know, uh, ALA or, um, or um, IV glutathione or things that, you know, L-citrulline, which will increase it. And you can mitigate a lot of that risk because those, those antioxidants actually get into your system into the cells, you know. Do you know anything about, I, I wish I could call this woman right now, but I, I hung <laughs> out with CNS who literally has been practicing longer than I've been alive. And um, she has this thing about LDLs and cholesterol numbers in general, because she says that actually there are a whole bunch of markers that were removed that are actually essential to dealing with heart health. And they were removed because of the agenda of, of prescribing statin drugs more frequently. I don't remember all of the markers she talked about, but uh, she definitely has been around longer than I've been alive. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, um, you know what's interesting, and I think I know what she's referring to. Um, it, it turns out that uh, for a long time, uh, you know, the, the uh, Drug companies and the insurance companies don't want to pay for particle numbers. And uh, it turns out that the number of particles in your blood, especially the, uh, the SDLDL particles, which are the most dangerous, are extremely important to damage to the endothelium. And yet it's very difficult to re get reimbursed for them. Uh, ApoB is an example of one that is a measure yeah. of particles. And it, it in the United States, it's considered experimental after 80,000 papers. In Europe, it's standard of care. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 and so, um, so I, you know, I understand exactly why she's saying that. Now, I will tell you, and, and I have a reference, a number of references for you, that two to four tablespoons of olive oil a day are equivalent to a statin, a moderate dose of statin. And it's, it's gram for gram, the decrease in risk. And you have to balance the calories against that. So, uh, and that data is ir irrefutable. And if you use it in conjunction with omega-3 fish oils, um, it's even better, you know? And uh, so, yeah, there, there is a, you know, what, what Baxter brought up, which is, and most cardiologists will say, the lower the LDL, the better. And, uh, and, and the data seems to support that. But what I want to point out, and the reason that um, olive oil seems to work, is because statins, and this is all statins, have a separate pathway that, that does some pretty dramatic things. It's called RHO. The pathway is RHO. And, um, and what it does is it increases nitric oxide in the endothelium. It makes it more elastic. It decreases inflammation and it thickens that cap. And so um, one could argue that is it really the lowering of LDL or is it really the pleiotropic effect of the statin that's doing that? And statins aren't the only drugs that have that. Um, you know, so and there's more to the story. And, uh, and, and yeah, I think that a lot of those markers that she's referring to um, will not be reimbursed. And, yeah, and, you know, and that's unfortunate. Um, 
And you guys, well, I, you know, look, Baxter brought this up and I'm just going to repeat it. In 2015, we hit a prevalence of cardiac disease that was expected in 2030. And what that means is that we're treating disease, but we're not preventing it. And that is a failure of the healthcare system. And the, the significant problem is that if you have a heart attack today, you're more than likely going to survive it. One out of every 19 or 20 patients will, will die, but the rest will survive. And if you survive it, the problem is that in two years, over half of those survivors are going to be permanently disabled in some form. So we got to prevent it. We got to do better. And and I, I'm, I'm almost done with this part, Baxter, but I think it, this is a very important slide because most people think that it's the degree of narrowing that's responsible for heart attacks. And, and this is a meta-analysis of multiple studies. Yeah. And what you'll see is that in patients with symptomatic angina, 75% or greater narrowing, 14% of the heart attacks occurred in that group. If you look at the 50% or less with no symptoms, almost 70% of heart attacks occur in that group. And the 20 to 30% group is the peak. And what that tells us is that these pimples and blisters, they look like this, uh, are dangerous. And these are not the ones that you can stent. These are, you know, these are uh, less than 60%, they're less than 75%. And so these are very dangerous, and that's why we need to pay attention to them. And here's why it's silent. Boom. And you get the blood clot. Okay. And what the pulse test is picking up is the inflammation in that lesion. So, so and Doug, I'm, that's a great point. I'm glad you put that. Can you go back a couple of slides? That I mean, the, the, the it's I don't know if we can emphasize this so much. Next previous slide to that. When you have the 50, the set, the, excuse me, the 75% are greater lesions with symptoms. Those are the lesions that we treat with stents and bypass. 50% or less. Uh, and, and if you got a 50% or less lesion, we're not even able to do uh, uh, flow reserve or anything analysis. We're just going to look at those things and say, if you got a 20, 30% lesion, there's a chance we won't even see that or it, or it won't be acknowledged by the cardiologist on the angiogram. And I, and I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've had patients who come and say, well, I had an angiogram and my cardiologist told me my heart, my coronaries were fine. They were normal. And then a month later, three months, six months, I had a heart attack. I can tell you my personal experience. I was called in the middle of the night to go to the emergency room to see a patient who was having an acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack. I saw him. He was sweaty, had all the symptoms. He was diaphoretic, EKG, classic heart attack. I rushed him to the cath lab, you know, stuck his groin, did the angiogram in the artery that was the heart attack artery. I shot the angiogram. Guess what I saw? Nothing. What happened was that that next slide you show, he had a plaque that was probably 10 to 20 percent. And mm -hmm. it ruptured. The clot form occluded the artery, gave him the heart attack. By the time I took pictures, the clot had dissolved. The body has its own thrombolytic agent. So before we gave him anything, yeah, uh, he had dissolved his clot. So it was a rare occasion where you can have a heart attack, you have all the symptoms, and then it dissolves. And at the night, during the time he was having a heart attack, I shot his corners and saw nothing. And it was yeah. really a 10, 20 percent plaque that doesn't show up very well on angiogram. So you and and that's why I mean, and, and I want to emphasize this. I'm, I'm sorry, my voice is getting louder, but. Uh, <laughs> I told you when you get excited, it gets there. <laughs> <laughs> many patients I see, you know, they they say, "Well, I have uh, blocked arteries. I got eighty percent, and the doctor said I need to hurry up and get a bypass, or hurry up and get stents because I might die tomorrow." And the lesions that more likely will kill you are the lesions that are hard to see on angiogram, more so than lesions that you see, and then 95 percent. Those things grow slowly. You develop collaterals oftentimes and so on and so forth. So I don't want to get too tight, but it's a very important point. I love those slides. I love the diagrams. Uh, I would like to borrow some of those slides if you don't you mind. Can, you can have any of my slides. I share these freely with everybody. You yeah, these, this is a beautiful set here. And, and I like the points you make because it's very point on. And, and for all of our listeners in the chat room on this, 
I hope you're, you're clear with this. Uh, give me a thumbs up in the uh, chat line if you understand the point that we're making here because it's a very important point. Uh, we hope you understand it to the point that you can explain it to mm -hmm. others. So those of you who are awake still, the, I see you there in the chat room. Give us a thumbs up if you understand this point because this is very important uh, message to understand and, and, and take home. But anyway, sorry, sorry about that. But that was a great point. Okay. Now I'm gonna, um, in the interest of time, because I see we're we're kind of moving along. I just want to point out some things that people overlook because this is our standard workup, and there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, modifiable risk factors. Most people don't do risk assessment, but when you look at the things that actually increase your risk, there are a lot of things that people don't pay attention to, like infections. For the people that have tick bites, um, you know, there's 20, 21 different agents in ticks that create endothelial damage. One of them is Bartonella, uh, Leptospirosis, Borrelia. Um, but there are other things like psoriasis. Um, you know, if I do lab work on them, they mostly seem normal. But they have a six to seven times greater risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And then the, the one that I, I absolutely love to hate is proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec. There, most of the studies indicate a 23 to 25% increase in the risk of heart attack with use beyond two weeks. I've got people coming in here all the time that have been on them for years. And uh, and so you, you really have to keep in mind that the endothelium is the biggest organ in the body. It's about 4,000 to 7,000 square meters. Most, most healthcare professionals will say skin, and that's only two square meters. And we're really talking about inflammation, which is the body's response to injury or infection. So. Um, Baxter, here's where we have some case studies if you want to. Yes, let's, let's go through some. And these are for the audience. Most of our patients are on lifestyle, not these. These are these are more for interest. This is these are extreme cases that we don't normally uh, deal with. We mostly deal with people who get put on lifestyle changes. So here here's. Uh, the vulnerable patient. This is a, an actor, a movie star. We were at the Oscars. And, um, and what, what you'll note here is that this was a reluctant patient. His wife made him come in because we were doing testing at the Oscars. And um, she made him come in because he just came back from Italy. And I, I said, well, what, why are you bringing him in here? Has he ever had any problems? She said, no. But he's normally really vital. In other words, he just has all kinds of energy. And since he came back, he's having trouble getting out of bed in the morning. And he seems listless. He's even had a little trouble uh, walking, but he doesn't have any chest pain. And you'll notice that almost everything here is normal. His calculator, risk calculators are normal. Uh, on his lipids, for the most part, he's normal. He's got a little mild elevation of his CRP. And um, his SDLDL is just low borderline. It's, it's not worrisome at all. How, however, and um, so, you know, this was, his, this was his state. He was seen at Cedar sinai two weeks later. And normally they would have sent him home at this point saying, just get some rest and, and we'll see you later. But because he had this, he had a pulse cardiac test, which was almost five times higher than expected. And the way you yeah. put that into context is this 12 percent i'm going to round these down a little bit means that patients of his age and sex with his score about 12 percent had a heart attack in the next five years but it also means that 88 percent did not so it's not a death sentence it's your check engine light is on but you'll notice that his expected score which is for a perfect human which is predominantly age and sex because you never completely get away from having a risk of a heart attack or stroke is about 2.1, 2.35. So he's almost five times higher than expected. And because of that, they didn't send him home. They did a stress echo, which you can see in V2 through V4. He's got some ST segment uh, alteration. And because of that, they did a perfusion study. And um, let me hide that. Um, oops. Can you see that still, Baxter? Yep. yep. Yep, that's uh, this is the rest image down here, and you see a complete donut. Oh yeah, and that's something. We stressed him. You can see that the donut is is not complete. So he had lateral and inferior ischemia. That's not enough blood flowing to that area of the heart. 
Yep. And they did a, uh, they took him for an angio after they saw this. And you can see he had a 95% left circumflex lesion right there. Yeah, which it looks like the dominant vessel too. Yeah. And, and it, it was successfully stented and he's doing very well. And he does uh, public service announcements for our not-for-profit foundation. So this is the hallmark of the vulnerable patient. This is the person walking around not knowing that they're in danger because there's no calcium in this one. It wouldn't have shown up on a calcium score. Okay. Now, why is that important? Let me get, let me give you a slightly different patient because this one we see a lot now. This gentleman was in one of our clinical trials a year earlier and his score was 3.6%, which for a 77 year old is really good. He had a positive family history on his mother's side, but she was a smoker. And uh, his lipids are amazing. He's a vegetarian. And this looks like a vegetarian profile. Um, and, and yet his daughter brought him in a year later after she had taken him to Kaiser, where they did this lipid profile and said, hey, he's just getting old, uh, take him home. And so we asked her why she was so insistent on having him seen again outside of the HMO. And she said, because his biggest complaint, he was under a lot of stress this year because my mother almost died three times. He was a primary caregiver. Mm. And, uh, and that stress seems to have taken a toll on him because even though he's not complaining of chest pain, I noticed that he has a little trouble going up the stairs now that he never did before. And he just seems tired. Now this fatigue is, is a very commonly missed symptom of heart disease, very commonly missed. So go ahead. Baxter. No, uh, I, it's it's great. The stress you mentioned, uh, I see a Sosa shaking her head. She wants to uh, uh, chime in. You know, you you we, we do talk about uh, the broken heart syndrome. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the Japanese term, but um, uh, I'm sorry. Takutsoba. Takutsoba. Yeah, Takutsoba disease and. Um, you, you. I mean, it's a, it's a well-known um, phenomenon. We don't uh, have any clinical profiles other than the history that we tend to put our arms around. So, I guess one question is: uh, Can your? I mean, I, I don't know if you've looked at your tests in that syndrome compared to others. If there are any parameters? that are particularly elevated in individuals with emotional stress or the like? Yes, there is. IL-16 in particular, the first biomarker that comes out when the endothelium is injured, mm -hmm. is elevated in stress, okay? It's, it's very prominent. It also is elevated in people with sleep apnea and with belly fat. Now, let me show you what his pulse test looks like. He was, you're early on 3.6%. He's now at 46%, wow. 46%, over eight times expected. And here's what's really going on with him. Um, okay, and they finally agreed to do a calcium score, which was 600, it's abnormal. Um, and they went to angiography and this is his LAD. And you can see that there's a little trickle of blood going through there. Um, and they were able to successfully stent him um, and what this really was an example of is something called chronic total obstruction. Mm -hmm. And he had a grade one, Timmy. And, uh, and, I, and I wanted to bring this up because this is really important. It's particularly common in diabetics uh, and, and up, up to 30% of them. And it's very difficult to do a PCI on it. Um, and 13% of these cases have more than one chronic total obstruction. Now, what's really interesting is that for the longest time, we thought that these patients were only surviving because they had collaterals, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out that fractional flow reserve studies showed that that is not the case. That's what, what's happening. And the reason they're tired is because the myocardium did not die. It goes into hibernation yep. until the blood supply is restored. But if you don't restore that blood supply within a, you know, a reasonable period of time, those myocytes, they fibrose and die. And um, that's why in diabetics who have this more frequently, 
it, it oftentimes is the case that a, a cabbage or coronary artery bypass might be better because only about 50% of these people can be successfully stented. So chronic total obstruction is important for people to keep in mind and people that come in with this complaint. Okay. Does that make sense? No, that's, I mean, I love the fact that you emphasize the symptoms of fatigue in the last two patients and not the classic chest discomfort. Many of my colleagues uh, overlook that. Uh, fatigue is a very important uh, symptom in any patient with cardiovascular disease, particularly women. But can you go back to that previous angiographic slide? Um, yeah. I'm treating a patient with a very similar problem. And, and to look at this first diagram, uh, the pre-stent diagram, of course, you see the obstruction there. And you really don't know the caliper of the vessel that you're dealing with uh, back here. You don't have collateral flow. You don't know. And so it's great that they were able to open that up. Now, if you look at here, it's not as bad as what I'm dealing with and what we've seen. But this vessel distal here is not normal. There's no. diffuse disease here, and you can almost compare it to the proximity. There's probably a disease in the proximity. So even though you open flow and he's gotten better, there's more work to be done there on the nutritional basis. And, and we treat these patients with aggressive uh, nutritional intervention, and we actually get more angiographic regression, uh, Ornish and, and uh, Esselstyn, so on, same type of thing. So e even if you were to bypass that, you go into here, you don't have the best targets and a bypass graft may close up uh, very soon after. So fortunately, they were open this clodal total exclusion, uh, clodal, uh, chronic total exclusion, uh, occlusion up with a stent and give them some flow. And I'm hoping that he's on an aggressive lifestyle uh, 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 intervention because you're not done treating this lesion. No, in fact, you have a really good eye, Baxter, because you see these arrows here are yeah. indicative of other areas where there is a problem, Yeah. right? Yeah, you've got good eyes. You must have done a few of these, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've probably done more of these than I've taught. But that, but that guy was already a vegetarian, correct? He was a vegetarian, but he had uh, really bad stress. And I'm going yeah. to bet you that during that year, he was not eating his usual vegetarian diet. I and think he, he was yeah. pretty he was and, and I just want to interject, the vegetarian diet and or the vegan diet can be one of the most unhealthy diets. Now, I promote a diet that's described as vegan, but I will say people who eat vegetarian diets and vegan diets can eat some of the most unhealthy food on the planet. So I don't, when somebody comes in and say, oh, I'm a vegetarian, or I'm a vegan. I say, okay, I don't know what that means. Tell me what you eat. <laughs> okay, so I just want to be clear about that because people know they're looking on chat with Montgomery. You for vegan? I said no. Yeah, like the reason vegan. why I was asking that question is because <laughs> for me, from an intervention standpoint, he needs to also manage stress better mm -hmm. and have some support systems in his life. He probably needs a therapist if his, you know, if his wife almost died three times. Yeah, and then he probably needs to meditate every day. You know what I mean? Just other yeah. lifestyle interventions in addition to diet. No, yep. we're, we're totally, totally on board with that. Um, you just got the eggs and the milk. Yeah, you know, you know, my my laugh. I laugh at you about the vegan diet because I've had so many patients come in and say I'm a vegan, and why <laughs> am I in such bad shape? And then I look, and they're carrying with them vegan muffins and vegan donuts that are probably loaded with sugar and carbs. Sugar and carbs, yeah. And it's probably oils, yeah. And it's yeah. vegan, but it ain't healthy. Yeah, <laughs> right. So. Dr. Dr. Harrington, will you speak to um, the baby aspirin? I mean, I know it's done for, uh, you know, so, so the platelets don't clot, but if we're talking about rupturing of a um, plaque, how much is that helping us? Well, you know what? I recommend people that have a high score and that are at risk carry two adult aspirins with them. And if they feel chest pain, they chew them right away because it will save their life. There is a lot of controversy about aspirin in primary prevention, maybe not so much in secondary prevention. But um, the, there were two studies published recently, and they both indicated that the risk of bleeding pretty much neutralized the, the uh, preventive value of aspirin. On the other hand, an 80 milligram baby aspirin a day in, in European studies seems to be helpful. And it also reduces your risk of colon cancer. 
you know so mm -hmm. I, you know the jury's out on that the guidelines are, are starting to not recommend it mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of people that are taking baby aspirin every day <clears throat> and, uh, yeah and if we've been doing it successfully we don't mess with it you know what, one of the problems is not everybody's uh, platelets and metabolism of aspirin is the same and there is a special urine test that you can get, which will predict your uh, ability to benefit from aspirin, but it's again, not covered by insurance. So, mm, okay. okay. Fascinating. You have one more case. We got a little time. We can go, we can spill over a little bit. Uh, our sponsors won't be too upset. Well, this was really kind of cool. <laughs> uh, so I select. I, you know, the ones I would really like to share sometime are the ones where we do prevention. Like, you know, if we have time, I'll show you one of my, I'm the medical director for the Tishimikin Creek. Uh, it's the first wholly owned Native American cardiometabolic research lab. But this guy here is interesting. He's one of the uh, Navy SEALs. He's a commander, um, SEAL Team 6, a lot of stress. He's only 47, but he's going to retire. And he's had multiple combat injuries. He's had chest pain since 2005 which was felt to be due to old rib and clavicle fractures. And you know, when you're retiring from the military, they aren't gonna pay you for anything that they think you did to yourself. But if it's military related, they'll pay for it. So he's, get, he's getting his discharge physical here from my colleague, Eric Harrison, who's the cardiologist for uh, the Navy SEALs. And you'll notice he did have a positive family history. His dad had a heart attack at the age of 44, a three pack a day cigarette smoker, so I'm not, you know, and and you ignore the BMI. These guys have so much muscle that the BMI is worthless in them. And um, everything else was pretty much normal. You'll notice his electrocardiogram was normal. His echo uh, was normal. He had an ejection fraction of 83%. He had a high, an athletic heart. Uh, the difference between the hypertrophy in an athletic heart and an abnormal uh, hypertrophy is fibrosis. He doesn't have fibrosis. Um, and then his CIMT was normal. Um, what's interesting is he was able to achieve maximal output on a stress test with no chest pain or electrocardiographic changes. And I, I find this one, and I know the guy that did it, and he's very good at it, um, but it's interesting. His calculators were normal, but the pulse test was 8.07%, which was over five times expected for his age. He should have been 1.51%. And because of that, uh, Eric Harrison, who's an imaging expert, he doesn't do angios, he does CT angios. He did a CT angio. And what you can see here is he's got, and this is with vital software, so you can get some really good cross-sectional studies. He's got a 60% LAD lesion here, which normally you would observe and go maximal medical therapy. You'd have to argue with the insurance company to get paid for it. But if you notice on cross-section, he has two necrotic core lesions and with no cap, hardly any cap at all. And Eric told him, look, we need to take care of this regardless because um, this, this will kill you. And so they put him on pre-op meds, you know, metoprolol, uh, hydrogrel, and uh, atorvastatin, and um, aspirin. They scheduled him for a PCI on Monday. This was on Friday, and he was in with his wife, who's a nurse, by the way, which was a lifesaver. And he, he went home, he didn't take his meds, and about 48 hours later, he started getting his usual chest pain, but his wife noticed he was sweating, so he was diaphoretic. She called the ambulance against his wishes, and you can see he's having an anterolateral ST elevation MI right here. You can see the evidence. Yep. So the question here is, and, and during this heart attack, his uh, ejection fraction dropped below 30%. So and, and this, I'm, I'm sorry, Doug, just for our audience to understand this is EKG real quick. This V1, V2, V3, you see this little spike. The spike is going down. It's OK for the spike to go down a little bit in V1. But by V2, you should have a little bit of upward spike and more of an upward spike in V3. If you look here in these leads, you see the spike going up. This spike is all going down, which means the electrode is looking at a part of the heart that should be showing down. Also, you see these ST segments that are up. And they should be flat with a hump, but they're elevated up like this. And so that's the acute nature of it. But you also have, there's a small R wave. So there's some early loss of electrical activity in the direction, as well as some uh, repolarization abnormalities that are consistent with an acute injury. And I just want 
people to understand they compare this spike with something like that, even though these are different parts of the heart, but but this spike here should look something like this or or at least closer to this should look more like that and, and like this here. But except the spike is going down and the little hump is the segment between the bump and the spike is up. And that's what we call it the ST segment, which is right here should be flat like that but it's not, it's up. And so that's what's telling you that this is an acute injury. Just so that they understand what's in the circle. I want, this is on tapes. So I want to get that explanation across. No, that was great. And it, once again, I'll compliment your eye. You, you've got a really good eye because this doesn't always project well. So I'm impressed. Um, well, let's look at what they did. They got him to the hospital. And the question is, did they get him there in time? He ruptured both of those lesions you can see right there. Yeah. They did a rescue stent. You got good revascularization. And what's interesting is this is an MRI six months later. You can see that white streak right there where my little hand is moving. Yep. That's scarring on the myocardium, but it's less than half the thickness. Six months later, his ejection fraction is recovered to 78%, which is remarkable. Mm. I agree. Now, look at this. We didn't have this at the time of the incident. Eric didn't. But this is a fractional flow reserve by CTA. This is done by heart flow in Palo Alto. Yep. And you can see the, the ratio should be 0.8 or, or greater. It's 0.5. So even though this looked only be 60%, it was more significant than we thought. Okay. Yep. So yeah. Functional flow reserve, just, I mean, that's just a way of measuring the physiology of the flow. And when we do the angiogram, you say 60% or 30%, the vast majority of the time we're eyeballing that. We're not even quantifying that. And, and we're trying to get, we're trying to make an assessment of a really two, well, three-dimensional, but at least a two-dimensional cross-sectional, we're just looking at, well, we're looking at a three-dimensional, trying to make an assessment of three-dimensional flow by just looking at a two-dimensional angiographic cross-section. And we're not even looking at at the cross -set, short axis cross-section, we're looking at the long axis, which is probably the worst two-dimensional uh, look. And so we're trying to make a, an estimate of a three-dimensional flow based on the two-dimensional image that's the less ideal two-dimensional image, not even the cross-section of it. So oftentimes we say it's 70%, 60%, et cetera, but when you put a wire down that measures flow, you can measure flow reserve uh, when you do certain types of uh, uh, pharmacological agents. And so that's what that FFR is. Uh, and, and so that's a very low fractional flow reserve. And so when we see that, we know that the physiology of that flow is bad. And uh, the one thing we don't have is, is the, the instability of that lesion. So even though it was a 60% lesion, it was probably an unstable lesion as you had yeah. an acute event. Yeah. Now, the, the reason I wanted to share this one is because, remember in the beginning I mentioned that half the people who survive the heart attack will be disabled in about two years. The reason for that is there's a 90-minute door-to-balloon window for STEMI. Uh -huh. and, uh, and if you can't get there within 120 minutes, you've got a 30 minute window for that optimum time for thrombolytic therapy while you're on your way to the hospital. And um, the biggest problem we see is people delaying going to the hospital. The median times for people to go to the hospital are 1.5 to 6 hours. They sit there with this pain or thinking it's heartburn. And unfortunately, women are more likely to delay than men. So we teach people that if they're walking around with a high pulse test and they've done everything they can, if they have any of these unusual symptoms that we've been talking about, they should go to the emergency room. And it's very important they say, I'm high risk for a heart attack because they operate by algorithms in the emergency departments now to triage you. And so for instance, we have uh, an attorney that went in and said, I have heartburn. And for three days, he went back and they gave him, you know, KO, um, um, they gave him antacids and stuff like that. And he, he actually had a massive heart attack. Another one, an attorney followed the directions, went there and he was having what he thought was heartburn, but he said, I'm high risk for heart disease. They uh, did a troponin on him. The troponin initially was normal. It did increase they figured that he was uh they set him up for a cta while he was on the, getting his cta his lad lesion ruptured while he was on the table and they were able to treat him immediately he's got no sequela he survived because he went there so this delay is critical
So Baxter, that, that's, that's, those are the, uh, the more that, delightful cases with a lot of images. And yeah, and I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll bag it right there. Yeah. And I'll, I'll I mean, this is great. Um, I know, um, well, let me just, I'm, I'm going to hold my piece for a minute. It's also Celeste, y'all have any comments or questions? It's, I mean, I this did, is the. <laughs> I did want to ask Dr. Harrington, I noticed you said that the pulse test is designed for people down to 20. Um, but has it been tested in younger? Because children, we're testing um, lipids between the ages of nine and 11 now. Um, and yeah. there are a lot of increased LDL, um, a lot of lower HDLs, um, a lot of elevated triglycerides, fasting um, lipid panels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and feeling, I mean, of course, we don't do imaging studies um, on in my clinic, but I'm feeling like a lot of these children probably do have some lesions developing. Um, and, you know, it's just not tested or thought that it's necessary until, you know, they get chest pain or, or something. So just wondering if, you know, anybody's looking at trying to find something that can be predictive when your children such that we can have a, a more of an impact on parents. Parents seem to respond better to lab tests and showing them that, hey, this no. is a problem. Um, so when I do get the lipids, for example, and I say, hey, this total cholesterol is a problem, they're 12. Um, yep. Then parents will say, okay, um, we will exercise or maybe we need to change our diet. But just wondering about the pulse test and how how far tests like this can, how young it can yeah. be. So, so the interesting thing is that when you're young, like less than 20, mm -hmm. you have a very resilient body and your endothelium is very uh, able very much able to repair itself. It is really not unusual on autopsy to find fatty streaks and early lesions in these kids. And we rely pretty much on an expanded lipid profile that includes LP little a, because there's a huge population of people out there that have a genetic predisposition that don't know it. And we also look at SD LDL. And the reason we're very fascinated with SD LDL is because when a patient comes in and says, I do everything right, doc, I eat right, and their SDLDL is in the borderline or elevated area, I can tell you they're getting too much sugar, too much refined carbs, excess alcohol or deep fried foods. It's as simple as that. And so we use that to kind of be a diet buster. And with kids, we found that the parents respond really well to the lipids. Um, and the only time that we'd go below 20 is if the physician really wants to do it and if there's a strong family history or a history of familial hypercholesterolemia yeah. and uh and and so I, I i'm being honest with you when i say i don't encourage it but i we do it occasionally at the request of the doctor and we really found that the the expanded lipid profile whether we do it or somebody else does it is not important um is really helpful for getting these kids to realize it like my kids I, i'll just use my kids as an example when they were really fond of fast food, they were out with their friends and they'd do something that I wouldn't let them do. And, and their, you know, their uh, triglycerides went up, their LDL was up, their SDLDL was up. And, uh, and I showed it to them and I got, I got two almost vegetarians right now. My oldest friend is a, is a vegetarian and they, they got religion. They, you know what I mean? They got shocked when they saw those numbers in the red zone. So, I don't know. That's we 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 really believe that the kids we need to get to the kids. You know, we got to teach them that they make this fast food addictive. They put sugar in the buns, which is unnecessary. You know, the the preservatives alter your hormonal balance. The uh, you know the plasticizers and stuff. It's just terrible, terrible yeah. stuff. You know. So. Yeah. And I, I think I don't know. You, I I like the panel discuss this, but. I think there's, to a certain extent, there's some irreparable damage. I mean, granted, you know, you go through your childhood. I mean, I ate some of the most horrible foods in childhood. Uh, but I think, you know, you can only reverse so much. I mean, I don't know what, that's my no, opinion. I, I agree. It's just, the, you know, the uh, number one, insurance will not cover it less than 20. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and then, you know, it, 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 to me, it, another big issue with our healthcare system is the insurers have now dictated how we practice medicine. Yeah, yeah. and that's, yeah. and they make more money than any doctor or nurse does. You know, the executives and those things, the the thirty five 
cents of every dollar goes to the management of those insurance companies. Um, I would, you know, look, I'm I'm not a communist, but I'd like to redistribute that wealth back to the healthcare professionals. Yeah, care of people. You know what I mean? Are these properly distributed the first time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just go. Right, right. Don't take insurance. But I think that I think that the 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 comment about irreparable damage not only I think the biggest damage that we do to people by not doing what what um, what um, um, Douglas was just talking about is we don't set them up for behaviors. <laughs> like I have, to, I have to deal with grown adults that I have to retrain their behaviors now because they have gotten to these horrible cycles when they were younger that are now imprinted and cannot be changed. You know what I mean? Or they feel like they can't change them. So we have to relearn how to form new behaviors. I feel like that actually is really one of the most damaging effects of it because sometimes then when a true habit is formed, it becomes unconscious. And then we just keep repeating it until we get a negative event or we're on our deathbed and we feel like, oh no, now I have to change to live. Yeah. Well, you know, look, I really, I completely agree with you. I worry about the irreversible nature of it. Um, you do do damage that is permanent. And um, there's only so much plasticity in a kid up to a certain point. Uh, but but we really need to get to them, especially in the in the schools where they used to teach them better things. You know, I mean, I, I thought the uh, the program where they tried to get more vegetables and fruit into the schools was a really good thing and take out all the sodas. I I, I wish they could have made it more interesting. <laughs> well, the, the problem with a program like that is that the parents aren't doing it at home. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't work if it's only done. No. Person. You know, that's what we tell people a lot. You know, look, you go out on a Saturday and you have a decent, you know, you have some fun and, and goof off a little bit, but don't kill yourself while you're out there. But it's what you do the rest of the week that's going to, you know, dictate what your body's going to feel. Mm -hmm. I, I We found that, you know, like we do a lot of uh, kids events and, um, we found that if you talk to them about it and you give them a little bit of the stuff that we talked about here, but in a simpler format, mm -hmm. they actually respond to that. They kind of want to know what it is they're doing to themselves. Oh yeah. You know, and like my kids, they, they used to get, the other thing they used to like was uh, Dr. Pepper and, and Coke, you know, and we don't have that in the house at all. We've never allowed them except for when we went to the movies once in a while. Now they get unsweetened iced tea, which mm -hmm. to me is, you know, that's progress, but that's just, you know, two out of the six. I don't yeah, know. I feel like we've, um, because we don't, I feel like we've lost the the memory that children are very intuitive in mm -hmm. their learning stage. So mm -hmm. in their stage, they want to know, understand their body. Um, when yeah. I explain things to them, I mean, they can be an active child, but they'll stop and listen because they want to understand what is happening. I think we have a tendency of, especially this generation, giving them the iPhones or giving them the iPad and letting mm -hmm. entertain them. And we don't interact anymore. You know, people aren't doing puzzles and um, Legos and things like this anymore. And they're just allowing the computer to feed the children um, yeah. through their eyes. And so they're losing their, so that means the adults are forgetting that children are intuitive. Mm -hmm. and take in information, but right now they're just taking in information from the computer or the iPad. Yeah, and it's not always good information, is it? That's never good information. <laughs> yeah, I want to uh, kind of reiterate what Sosa said about um, behavior, and Celeste, you and I talk about this uh, a lot, and when you think about behavior, and although you know, we, we, I spend a lot of time counseling people on eating behaviors and the like, but when you look at our behavior globally, um, it's, you know, moving, being outdoors, being in nature. Um, we're indoors a lot. We're eating bad food. Um, you mentioned stress. A lot of our lives are very stressful for different reasons because our environment is, is stressful and, and unusual. So uh, that whole behavior aspect, I think, is very important. Uh, we spend a lot of time on food because we can directly correlate that and we can, you know, that's kind of a, 
a, a straight line, but but other aspects of our behavior, sleep, exercise, but this contact with nature. So so you know we're going to be exploring a lot of these different uh, components of our health. But um, but Doug, as always, it's it's a pleasure. Uh, I appreciate uh, the great work you're doing and. Um, Again, consider yourself having an open invitation to the show. I'll come up with some something else for you to talk to us about. <laughs> but uh, the you know, you know, okay. Doctor, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to be just one of the panelists sometime and hear uh, Celeste and Asosa talk about their aspects. Because for us, you know, food is life, and the kids are the gold that we have to deal with. And I, I you know, most of what we do here revolves around food and exercise and lifestyle. And and if we don't start with the kids and if we don't have people like Asosa trying to re-educate adults who have gotten off topic, I mean, we're in trouble. And I know what you do, Baxter, in your clinic is unique compared to most of the uh, you know physicians out there. You really, you practice what you preach and you get people to buy into it. And I think that's what's really unique about your whole approach. And we love it. We love it. So well, thank you very much for the kind words. And I think uh, Celeste, you're up October 26? 26. Okay, so I'll, I'll shoot you an email today. And it's so so we're working on her next date. So we're all in the rotation to do a presentation. So I'll let you know. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna time. have my twin 16 year olds here listening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would appreciate it. We look forward to it. But again, thanks a bunch. I'm gonna close out the show and I'll see you guys behind stage. Uh as uh uh, always, everybody, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, visit with you. And and again, as I said, this show is uh, very important. Uh, I apologize that I wasn't able to um, to get uh, get it advertised in advance. But uh, I really hope that you guys, if you liked it, if you're new to the show, please subscribe or like. And of course, please share this. This is valuable information. The poll score is a test that can tell you whether you're at high risk. Uh, if you're at high risk, you may have mild symptoms of fatigue or the like. If you have a very high pulse score, it's possible that those very mild symptoms of fatigue or chest discomfort may be signs of overt uh, heart disease. And we saw some examples of an individual that didn't have specific cardiac symptoms, but just had fatigue. Uh, but it uh, uh, increased his awareness uh, and uh, allowed him to go in and get um uh, help sooner and it actually made a difference in its overall well-being. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions, uh, email us at wellness at montgomeryheart.com. And uh, anybody who's looking for any kind of uh, support, uh, we have an online uh, support program. Go to our uh, website at online.montgomeryheart.com uh, to get more information. So until next time, we hope you keep it fresh, natural, and live. Thanks for